Hey, welcome to the meeting being held today, Tuesday, August 8th, 2023. And our start time is at five o'clock. Um, Michelle, if you are to go after mom, I can call the roll. Can you, if you can please call the roll. Sure. Dr. Corbin, present. Alana, present. Bonnie. Hi, roll call. Present. <laughs> I, I didn't hear. Sorry, it. Casey. Present. <laughs> David. Chris. Present. Adam. Hey. Adrian. Aaron. Present. Sabrina. Ali said she was going to be late. Sue Ann. Present. Jonathan. Present. Matt. Present. Patty. Present. Randy. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I guess we're going to start with uh, public comments. Do we have any? We do. Yeah. Um, I, I have, uh, this is Matthew Shake again. I do have a, a brief public comment. Um, Just to let you know, we're going to have to hold you to two minutes. So go ahead and get started when you're ready. Um, okay, yeah, this will be very brief. Um, I was at the meeting uh, two months ago in June to report about a, an incident with a drone flying uh, from uh, the Parks and Lads edition over the residential neighborhood and filming uh, for nine hours uh, on a Saturday um, Memorial Day weekend. It was May 27th. Uh, and, you know, the neighborhood wasn't notified. It's caused a lot of a pretty big disturbance. Um, anyway, I've been in contact with the parks director. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sorry. Um, and there's been, there's been some, some, sorry, I, I don't, I'm getting some sound coming sound. through. You're sounding just fine on our side. Okay. Okay. Fine. Okay, fine. Uh, and the uh, the, um, sorry, that threw me for a second. Um, anyway, just, just to sort of, uh, get the board up, up to speed. Um, there's a, an intergovernmental agreement between the parks department and the Portland film office, which is part of Portland prosper. Uh, and the Portland Bureau of transportation is also in there. Um, and you know, basically as it appears right now, sort of by design, the film industry has sort of blanket right to use the parks as airports for their drones to take off and fly wherever they wish uh, with, uh, you know, just by getting, you know, paying the permit fee. There's no oversight. No one's reviewing anything. Uh, there's, you know, no one's reviewing a flight plan to make sure it's an appropriate use of the park space. Uh, they don't, you know, the film industry doesn't have to prove any sort of public benefit. They just sort of have blanket privilege to use it whenever they wish, uh, as long as they, uh, you know, pay the permit fee, fee, you know, a few days in advance. Um, uh, the the parks director, the, the parks director's office is, seems to be uh, under the uh, mistaken impression that there is a notification requirement that the film industry has to notify residents in advance uh, of any disturbance. Uh, that's not accurate. Um, no one seems inclined to change anything. Uh, this struck me as a very simple problem to fix, so I'm, I'm sort of surprised that uh, nothing has happened and no one seems motivated to do anything about it. Um, maybe that's just sorry, you know, par for the course, I don't really know. Um, but, you know, if anybody on the board wants to look into that at all, fine. Otherwise, the way it's going to stand is um, that the, you know, the film industry can sort of do what they want uh, with drones. And um, uh, unless the Parks Department changes policy, uh, that's just the way it's going to be. And uh, that's all I got. You're at your two minutes. And I, I just want to, for you to know that we do hear you and we do hear your concern. I believe as, as residents ourselves, we, we are worried about this. From my understanding and direct along, we want to kind of jump in on this, that a lot of this is out of our jurisdiction. But I think the continued conversation between you and direct along hopefully will um, come to a resolution. Oh, okay, thank you. Yes, I mean, I have no idea who is the right person to talk to in the department. I'm sort of lost in the whole process, but I, I appreciate your 
your statement your there. Statement there. Um, uh, I just want you to know that we do hear you, and I think a lot of us were, were taken aback about the idea of being filmed, you know, um, without our, our approval. So we do hear you, and I'm hoping that we can find the right people for you to talk to so, so this can resolve itself in some way. So thank you so much, and if, if you are interested, um, feel free to, to contact us. So moving to the next um, commenter, again, thank you, um, Matthew. Please come up to all that. Yes. Hi, how are you doing? Come on up. <laughs> Am I here to just- You, you can just stand up here, but you're and, 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 and yeah. a couple things, please make sure you don't um, give out your, your phone number or email address or anything like that. And we do give you two minutes to, to make your comments. Um, it most likely it won't get solved here, but it will definitely um, follow up if necessary, whether through uh, the director or other staff. So thank you for, for coming down to make your comment. You have two minutes. Sweet. Um, hi, my name is Fiona. Thank you all for doing all the stuff we do. Um, I'm also on the board, so I'm working a lot of work. My apologies. I had no idea this was going to happen. I'm kind of just jumping in here because I made a comment to someone at the desk. He's like, I wish I could say something. And they were like, <laughs> so here I am. Um, it's a really like small thing. And then I apologize. I got to go because my kids are in the hall. I said, oh, I'll just be one second. Um, so who knows what they're doing. So here's my quick thing. I am a parent of three kiddos. And um, thanks to the access pass, my sweat with that. Uh, I am now able to um, afford to do things for all four of us, which is great. The only problem is the catalog, the actual like print catalog. No one ever seems to know when it's coming out. There's never like a set deadline, like, oh, it will be out on this date of this month. Every quarter I ask, hey, do you know? And they're like, we don't know. And then every quarter it comes out like two minutes before registration. I'm exaggerating a little bit. Um, I know it's available online, but I'm pretty old school. I look young, but I'm really 73. I like to sit with the highlighter and pen because I have three kiddos. School schedule, my schedule, can't do that online. Also, forgive my words, but the online is not uh, really, really user friendly. Uh, it's difficult. I've looked for classes, roller skating, nothing comes up. And then I put in skating and two classes come up. It's bizarre. So I always feel like I'm going to miss stuff if I don't have the actual catalog. Um, so it would be so great. And I also know because every quarter I ask, when is it coming out? Nobody knows. And every quarter they say, you know, we get this so much from people. <laughs> um, so I know other people are saying similar things. It would be great if we could have the print catalog a couple weeks prior and if there was a set date and everybody knew. So if I walked up to a counter at any community center and said, hey, do you know when that's coming out? They'd say, absolutely. The last Tuesday of the month or whatever it is, you know, that would be swell. It would be so helpful to like help people like me plan, you know, I'm planning or little twitchy about it. But um, that's Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You have your information, Joey? Okay, Joey's going to make sure that we reconnect with you so that we can have somebody um, be in contact. Great, thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Any other com public comment? So that is our last public comment. Is that correct? Moving to general announcements. Do we have any general announcements? I have a general announcement if folks don't. Um, so some of us have been the, have had the privilege to experiencing the trainings for wave three. And I got some feedback from other board members and there are some questions regarding the questions for, um, for wave three. And I wanted to know, um, Director Long or from staff, um, is there any wiggle room in changing or augmenting any of those questions or adding to it? Um, I don't believe that we have anyone here from community engagement. Um, Todd is 
out. Claudio is sitting in for him, but I don't know if he knows the answer to that question. Um, I think that there might be room to uh, maybe augment, but not to add or change, because I believe we've already been out in public asking those questions. So we really want to make sure that that is stays pure. So um, I'm going to suggest that an email, perhaps, hi, Claudio, that maybe we send send the request and maybe even some more specifics um, to Tim Collier and copy Claudio and Todd um, just so they, they know. Um, so maybe, but again, like I don't know how deep we've gone and how and, and how many how, how much we've engaged. I know that they created that video and, and such, and I know it's been used at least once or twice. And so um, for the sake of data collection, it, it's still pretty early, but I don't know how far along. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I hope that. I can and there was some scientific, you know, conversation about why those questions. There's a lot of work. So um, there, there might also just be an opportunity to have a deeper conversation about why those questions should be important. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, in the future, um, as we, we talk about the board as a resource and the board as a vetting um, body, it would have been really nice for us to be a part of that um, process sooner. And I also understand that we may not always be a part of processes, but I think this is probably one that could have been very um, beneficial um, to, to all parties. So thank you, Director. I, hey, I hate to do the gotcha moments, but um, as my job as a chair, I do look at the requests. Thank you so much. Um, any other general announcements? Um, just really quickly, any board members that want to talk later on regarding the questions around on my degree, please contact me after the meeting online or if you want to do a Zoom meeting, that's I'm open to that as well. Um, moving to approve July meeting minutes. Do we have any edits? Corrections. If not, do we have a motion to adopt the minutes from the July meeting? Wonderful. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor of adopting the July minutes as is, please raise your hand or say hi. And it looks like the majority is that moves forward. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, moving towards uh, the working group reports. Um, because of time, um, we're going to use this as if there's any Q&A regarding um, the working groups, um, except for um, the, the discussion of new working groups in which Adam has been um, really helpful in creating some slides to go over that with us. But starting with the Board of Affairs working group, do we have any questions for uh, Casey? Thank you. Land use and infrastructure. Any questions for David? David Henson. David. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did, I did, I did. There were two there errors. Were two error. um, report that I wanted to fix. Um, I had the date wrong and I missed a couple of folks in attendance. So I'm going to try and uh, update those and send them in to be included for the record. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. Fin uh, financial statements. Oh, sorry, Casey. Um, David, I wasn't quite sure what's going on with the I five letter. I was a little confused about what she had. So for the over, I I believe the I, I'm going to try and pull it up here so I can see exactly what we wrote. But I think the intent was that because we missed our window, we're just going to we're going to pause on it until we have our next opportunity. And David, you email. There's an email from Brett Horner today about okay. that. You know to connect with staff at the Bureau of Planning Sustainability um, and was able to further sort of clarify um, how we should proceed. And it seems like there will be an opportunity, a better opportunity for the board to weigh in in the fall. Awesome. So, so yeah, just um, take, take a gander at your, your inbox. Um, that was just sent today. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Um, community Engagement Working Group, any questions? Answering. So you did skip over financial sustainability. Oh, I'm so sorry. Financial you know, sustainability working group. And I just wanted to make a correction. I made an error when I 
noted the next meeting date. Uh, I skipped over August. Um, I happen to not be able to attend that meeting, but Jonathan has agreed to share it. Um, and with Casey's support. That will be on the 17th. Thank you. Questions for community engagement working group. Right. If there's no questions, I'm going to give the floor to Adam, um, and he will be focusing on the discussion on the new working group basis. Perfect. Thanks. I think, Dave, I'm sorry, David has a comment oh, about, right. uh, about skipping the director's report. Yes. Are we skipping that? We updated, yeah, we updated the agenda, um, the hard copy agenda, um, because I wanted to make sure that we had enough time for our guest presentations um, and any Q&A that might happen, and then also um, to reserve some time for additional public comment. So I'm, I'm the dispensable report. <laughs> read the 12-page read the twelve page one that's in your <laughs> But if there are any um, questions regarding that, please send them my way and I will compile them and send it to Director okay. Long. So unless you really want to change your view. No? Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. And I'm the floor source. Cool. Thank you, Dr. Corbin. Um, this is exciting, y'all. Um, I am very happy to get working on the new working group that's going to be centered around programming arts, culture, and nature. Please keep in mind that's definitely a working title. Kind of a mouthful for now. Um, before I dive into sort of how we've structured this and where it's heading, first of all, keep in mind none of this is final, right? This is our first stab at it. We're looking for feedback. We're looking for engagement. Um, and second, the the logic behind structuring it this way really came out of the board retreat and thinking about what the board's role is as a conduit between the department and the community and how we can best serve that purpose and how we can best fulfill our charter. So. Taking a stab at what sort of a guiding mission here should be, and I'm, I'm not going to read through this, but I do want to highlight three things. Is we really want to focus on thoughtful accountability and review of what the city is doing, what the parks department is, is striving towards. We can deliver strategic recommendations when it's appropriate. And then once again, when it's appropriate is to collaborate with staff to um, help them achieve the goals outlined in Health Parks Healthy Portland. Um, and if you're a reader like me, the uh, the Healthy Parks, Healthy Portland document outlines, we've got six or eight different strategic priorities. And so what we really wanted to do with this working group is to not root it in something that's ambiguous between department staff and the board itself, but to focus on priorities that we can both agree on. And so we pulled out the ones that are most uh, most germane to programming. And that was um, focusing on accessible, safe, clean, well-maintained public spaces, um, the necessity to encourage the learning, play, and discovery, um, preserving mental, emotional, and physical wellness, as well as fostering a sense of community and civic connection in parks through specific programs. And if we're looking at this, this work, we're looking at evaluating um, programs and facilitating uh, public comments into the board. We always want to do this through um, through the lens of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. We want to be collaborative with not only each other, our staff, but also the community. We want to focus on innovation and constantly ask ourselves, if we've always done it this way, is that the right way to be doing it? Um, and of course, like, like our charter, we want to be representative and accessible. And so with all of this, this is great. These are all lenses that we can evaluate our work. Um, but what are we actually going to do? And so the three things that I've distilled down that I think this working group should be focused on is number one, accountability and review. Number two is strategic guidance when appropriate. And then third is staff-led collaboration to make sure we're not overburdening staff and to make sure that they're pulling in our expertise when it's most needed. But with those first two, with accountability and, and strategic guidance, we can always offer that check and that measure of accountability. So what this all looks like put together is, is a strategy like this. And so you'll notice that there's quite a bit of white space at the bottom here. That's where we fill in different initiatives. That's where we drill down and we focus on specific policies, on specific programs. Um, I know access to swimming has been a big thing that's come up reoccurring. 
uh, in these meetings, and that could fall down under some of the initiatives that we can attack. Or, excuse me, not not quite attack, but uh, but review and hold the department accountable, provide strategic guidance where necessary, and uh, um, collaborate with staff where necessary. And so right now, as you can imagine, building a new working group takes time, it takes thoughtful process, and it takes a lot of different voices in the room. Um, right now, we're in phase one, right? We've developed a working charter. We have a, a baseline strategy house. Um, and so right now, we're really in this identification phase. We want to identify staff liaisons. So who are the folks from the department that are going to most sit in on our meetings? And we recognize this might change over time. Um, and we also want to identify key focus programs. So for example, um, if we're heading into, a, into the summer season, when the department is planning for summer free for all, those are the same programs that we should be looking at as well to make sure that our, um, our uh, evaluation of programs is, is happening on the same schedule that the city is. Um, we're gonna move forward with a smaller working group to get the rollout going in this first stage just so we're not trying to coordinate like eight different schedules to meet with somebody. Um, if you signed up and said that you were interested in joining this working group, you will have a survey coming to you later this week for input not only on this presentation, but general direction of where the working group is going. Um, and then when we move into phase two, we're gonna start running these working groups the way that they traditionally run, where we have a staff liaison, we're meeting at least once a week. Um, and then hopefully, uh, in the next five to six months, this will be running itself and it'll be able to function like a normal working group is. Um, so Dr. Corbin, I don't know if you allocated time for questions or if we yeah, should we stop there. Some time for okay. questions based on uh, our, our time. I have a, a really quick question. Yeah. Are you going to be meeting once a week? Or once a week? <laughs> what did I say? Once, once a week. week. Wow. Uh, once, once a month. <laughs> That's maybe yeah. Sorry. I know you're dedicated. Yeah. That's that's a little much. Thank you, Adam. We open up the floor for questions. Yeah, direct one. Um, a couple of things. Can you send the survey also to the division managers who sure. head those divisions that this work could conceivably touch because mm -hmm. they will be sort of the main points of contact and identifying staff liaisons Perfect. and key focus programs. Um, so I can give you a list later, um, but I think it would be really helpful to get their, their sort of feedback and, and, um, and input early right. to help sort of inform uh, what the working group, how, you know, how it operates and moves forward. And, um, and I'd just love to have a conversation to really sort of refine some of the language yeah, to absolutely. make sure that um because we want this to, <laughs> I, I think accountability is fine sure. right but in the spirit of collaborative partnership i just want to be sure that we're using language that feels that way yeah that absolutely way. So, thank you yeah so thank yes you. yes to both thank you yeah. we can yeah. go with matt and then kathy yeah, thanks for your great work out of everyone else who worked on that. Um, just to go back to the goals, the slide that had the goals on it. I think it was slide five. I was just curious where you see the nature component of the working group overlapping with the goals. Like, which of those, where's the interface there? Right, that's a great question. Um, so I think we have to, this actually goes back as well to our values here. We have to really challenge how we view programming. I think that programming in itself can often just mean sports teams to people you sign up for something and then you're into a program and that includes accessibility to nature. And so how we're programming everything from environmental justice programs, to access to parks, um, even just making sure that communities feel welcome to use parks that are next to their house. Um, so I think that's a great question and, and is definitely woven into programming. Thank you. I think we're going to go to Kathy, who lives online with us. Go ahead and you can ask a question. Thank you. Um, this is my first time here. I don't even know if this is the right place, but um, I live in the Pearl District, and I live right next to Tanner Park at Northwest Marshall and 10th. And um, 
I don't have dogs and I love going to the park and I love that Tanner Park is supposed to be a dog free park, but people take their dog there day and night, all day and all night. I could just be sitting there for 10 minutes and 10 people will come in there with their dogs. And so my question is, um, does somebody volunteer or patrol, patrol the park to, you know, ever uh, discourage this kind of behavior? Kathy, thank you so much for your question. It definitely aligns with a programming question for sure. Um, unfortunately, we don't have an answer for you right now, but please feel free to either email us and we can actually provide an answer for you. But you are at the right place, but the time <laughs> would have been during uh, during comments. So just for future, hopefully that means that you will return and, and be in community with us. But um, please email us so we can follow up with you. Okay, and that email, it would be? I will put that in the chat on who you can email and then you can keep that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So, and, um, Adam, thanks for your uh, beginning of a big, ambitious um, goal. So, um, really appreciate the people meeting tour of this facility. It, it is so powerful to know that parks is also including arts. Culture in all consolidate into this 100 year old building. And, and I, I don't know if there's any opportunity for us to consider that maybe if the board in any way we can help bring some of this incredible um, rich program that's out here to other neighborhoods that are very far from here. Um, for people who are going to be living around here, it's, it's just no brainer. You're going to sign up. But I realized one of the undergrad um, guy was staff was saying some of the students actually came from North Portland to come here to take classes, weaving and ceramics. Um, I, I can't imagine the amount of traveling they have to make our way here. And as, as a board, I would hope that we can find a way to bring some of this incredible rich resources also to, to the neighborhoods. More, more, I think when the working group gets up and running and we have an opportunity to bring staff in to um, inform the working group of the work, we do have hub and spoke arts programming that is out in the community. It's just not at this scale and it's not um, this in-depth and focused. So we are doing that work um, and we have a lot of partners that we work with as well. And we have the community music center and they just have to be specialized mm -hmm. facilities. So uh, there is some of that work happening. Um, it's just not at the grand scale as you're seeing here. I know this is pretty awesome. <laughs> so, um, but we'll continue to have those conversations for sure. So it sounds like this is very much a treasure and there's going to be gems throughout. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, go ahead and um, Chris. This is less of a question and more of a comment. Um, I think this is um, a great structure to put forth. I think what I'm just wondering is where is the cross-section intersection of this working group and community engagement because programming is so large. Like if early learning and education spaces that are available to the public and those slots. We know even from today that we have the waiting list for like pottery and ceramics and weaving, but also for swimming classes. So pro programming itself is so large. Um, and then natural spaces is also a very large area and there are areas of intersection or differences. Um, but members of the community also have feedback, like even when um, certain catalogs are available to sign up for classes and via the content and the area that they are available. So just thinking um, through how we can really partner with the community engagement strategies in particular for this working group and that working group because um, just the breadth 
is so large. Yeah, we try to fit it all in communicate it. And, and this is where you saw the, the slip between programming. And so I think definitely having a conversation about what belongs where and what are those, like you're saying, the opportunities to collaborate. So thank you so much, Chris. And, and I think like a lot of the, the questions and the comments that have come up for this is frankly exactly what we were hoping for. Um, you know, Director Long's comment about the language and making sure that it's streamlined with, with a more collaborative lens. You know, Sue and your comment about, you know, almost like heat mapping where programs are throughout the city. We haven't had a formalized body on the board to do any of that work until now. And Chris, yeah, we're, we're gonna have to figure out gaps between different working groups. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate that feedback. Thank you. Um, slide description. Um, no. <laughs> um, any other questions for, for Adam and any questions on the new working group? Thank you so much, Adam. Yeah. Very much appreciated. Um, we are moving to the Portland Parks Foundation report. Randy? It's called roll present. call, and it doesn't look like he's here now. All right. <laughs> I'm done. Thank you so much. And so, way before time, uh, we have the Natural Resource Service Delivery presentation. And then you're ready. Come on up. Thank you so much for joining. So um, I don't even know. Yeah, this, I will start. But yeah, I that was gonna be my question. Presentation and driving. I can run with the bow, and I can just put the slides up. And do you want to kick it off? That's perfect. Yeah. I wasn't sure. Yeah. All right, everyone. Um First of all, I want to welcome, we have a lot of guests um, both in the room and on Zoom joining us for this presentation. Um, I'm really uh, pleased to introduce uh, the Natural Resources Service Delivery Assessment work, which um, for many of you, I'll just a little background in the environment and climate section of the city charter reform uh, resolution of 36709. Um, this resolution directed Parks and the Bureau of Environmental Services to work with the Water Bureau and Transportation and the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability to uh, consider the integration of services related to nature, green infrastructure, watershed management, natural areas, urban tree canopy, and other areas of alignment, including a new organizational and reporting structure that reform and enhances central service delivery meets regulatory and financial requirements and best practices, and includes community engagement and consideration. So the resolution directed the bureaus to develop a work plan that achieves opportunities to integrate these services that would be delivered to the chief administrative uh, uh, administrator's office by the fall of 2023. So right around the corner. And uh, we've been fortunate to have the support of some really fabulous consultants who are here with us today uh, to present to you. And first, I'd like to introduce Chris Caldwell from Metalysis, uh, who will lead us through the first part, portion of the presentation session. Thank you, Dr. Long. I have a request for you. So yes. I can we make sure that we go through the full presentation and then we'll do the Q&A so we can guarantee the Get sure. to see the whole thing. Sure, absolutely. So put down if you have any questions on particular slides, put down the slide number and we'll we'll have a Q and A section. So thank you so much. And I'll give you a little orientation to how what we'll be seeing. Uh, but uh, thank you, Director Long. Thank you, Dr. Corbin. My name is Chris Wall Caldwell, and I'm the founder and principal consultant at Catalysis. And um, I'm joined with, uh, by my colleague, Janine Dossier. She's the principal consultant at New Theory Consulting. We work on a number of projects together. We have some friends in the room we've worked with before. Um, but we were brought in to help facilitate the conversations around this. Um, we are not uh, here as experts on this topic, but we both have uh, good familiarity with the city uh, and have had um, significant experience working with community engagement around city projects. 
Uh, there's one little error on this agenda. So Don, I'm not Don. Don Uchiyama is not. She's I know she's not. online, but she is not kicking us off. But thank you, uh, Director Long. We heard from Director Long. I'm going to, um, to start by giving a little bit of a high level orientation on what we've done so far. So this is more of a process piece. Um, and then Jamila is going to go into what some of the outcomes of that process have been. That's when we're going to uh, shift gears and we're gonna, um, we're gonna not do the Q&A in the middle about that process. So hold on to your kind of big process questions till the end, because then we're gonna go turn it to Becky Steckler from Eco Northwest, one of the other consultants, and she and her team worked on uh, an assessment of the natural resource inventory that they, were, that they compiled and were given. So we're going to be starting big picture vision, you know, visioning things, what is possible in responding to the city resolution, how did we get there, um, some of the outcomes from those early conversations, and, and then digging into it a little bit more detail. I want to emphasize that this work is very um, preliminary, that these discussions are preliminary, which is why we are here. We met with um, the pub last week while we're here with you, uh, start to get some initial So um, I'll describe a little bit then of what has happened to date. So with the passing of the city resolution, uh, the bureaus got together and said we need to be able to hold some conversations uh, so that we are not just working as separate bureaus on this resolution, but indeed we are pulling out of those perspectives and looking at the larger picture of what's possible for the outcomes for the city of Portland, the people of Portland, if there is a different approach to natural resource delivery. So to do this, we held workshops with the five bureaus um, represented with the bureau directors and staff who are subject matter experts at those bureaus. At the workshops, we identified preliminary vision thoughts. Uh, we really did start at that high level and had people drawing pictures, uh, you know, what really is possible so that we move out of those containers of the individual bureaus. We looked at what are really some of the problems and therefore opportunities that are being addressed by the city resolution and what is possible, starting with some blue sky scenario planning. Then um, part of that process also involved each of the bureaus contributing to an inventory assessment. So this, and Becky will talk more about this, but this is bringing together what are all the agreements, what is all the work, what are the, um, uh, how does money uh, work between bureaus regarding natural resources, and what can we understand about that big picture of what's happening in the city of Portland. Um, Eco Northwest has uh, done that and identified some preliminary opportunities for us to consider. And this is really this early work of where we are. We're having some of these initial conversations and we're going to be following up our conversation today with a survey um, that you'll be getting from our team. So it'll be confidential. Uh, you may, um, may will probably get it from a number of the member of my team, Kyle Yoshioka or Lauren Moreno on my team, who are going to be providing that survey. So we, even though there's a lot of information that we're going over tonight, you will have an additional opportunity to look deeper at those opportunities and provide some different perspectives on those. I'm going to, with that, then I'm going to turn it over to Jamila to talk about what the outcomes of those workshops were. Yeah, so as Chris said, we really started high level, blue sky. You see some drawings here, lots of trees and roots and community. Um, so in these preliminary workshops, we met twice so far. Uh, we had the groups break up into three different groups and they created posters to represent a potential vision for the future of this natural resource delivery. Um, the question that they had to answer with these beautiful posters was, what does an integrated natural resource delivery model look like for Portland? What does it look like for our employees? What does it look like for the public? Some of the, some example content that came from this poster work was, we have a real chance to stop tweaking around the margins and use this moment to create a system that provides world-class community service and resources to protect our natural areas, invest in our communities, 
and ultimately meet our city and community goals. Something else that came up is that we will have accurate information, inventory and maintenance ownership related to natural resources and appropriate funding, planning and resourcing. And this will allow us to boldly and comprehensively strengthen and grow our systems of green and blue infrastructure, improve the quality of life, all life in Portland, and elevate the city's climate mitigation and resilience actions. As we move through our process, uh, we were able to uh, identify some very high level problems, as well as some opportunities to address these problems. The first problem being that there's unclear ownership and distribution of responsibilities. So the opportunity here is to emphasize shared goals while refining clarity of scope, purview, and coordination between bureaus. Our next problem is that there's no clear route for identifying and integrating community needs and expectations. So the opportunity here is to identify community needs for a functional, healthy, natural resource delivery and contribute to Portland's recovery. Our next problem is that efficiencies and redundancies are present in current processes and resource management. That became very clear in our time together that there are a lot of, of redundancies in, in these different processes. So this is really an opportunity to identify those and have a more streamlined approach to this work. So the opportunity here is to efficiently allocate and manage resources and funding in service of protecting natural areas. And our final very high level problem is that the public has difficulty understanding and na navigating natural resource systems. And the opportunity here is to create cohesive framing and vocabulary across departments to increase navigability and access. We also needed to identify what is in scope and what's out of scope. Otherwise, there's way too many things on the table, and it's really hard for us to have a clear direction of this work. So through our discussions, we were able to identify um, that access to nature, environmental education, stewardship, and community gardens, along with climate resilience, environmental planning and policy, fish and wildlife, green stormwater infrastructure, natural areas, remediation, urban tree canopy, vegetation, and work initiated and facilitated by one of the five bureaus on private property. And what we were able to identify that's out of scope are those privately initiated and facilitated projects on private property and the Bull Run Watershed, recognizing the federal nexus. We also were able to identify that there are some things that we might need to consider and maybe do some more research on. Um, and that is that includes environmental remediation, uh, the example being Superfund sites and uh, the non-public right away within the natural spaces that the city currently doesn't own. So I'm gonna pass it back to uh, Director Long and talk more about this blue sky green storm. Great, thank you. So um, this graphic represents a draft framework that reflects the input that we received from the project team workshop that we held back in April. Uh, some of the visions for natural resource service delivery we heard included that um, we wanted to boldly and comprehensively strengthen and grow our systems of green and blue infrastructure, improving the quality of life, of all life in Portland. Use this once in a generation moment to create a system that provides world-class community service and resources to protect our natural areas, invest in our communities, and ultimately meet our city and community goals. Deliver a healthy, clean, ecologically diverse system providing wildlife habitat, access to nature, flood storage, and other ecosystem services. And harness our protection and restoration tools to support Portland's recovery. Portland has uh, the experience and the know-how to meet climate resiliency goals, including a more robust forest canopy, increased infiltration, carbon sequestration, and other and further connections between permanently protected natural area 
and lands. Combined, these goals create a strong vision, a feasible implementation strategy, and a set of performance metrics that not only bring us all together as a motivated workforce, but that also hold us accountable to each other and to our community. We see this work as an unprecedented opportunity to build on our history and meaningfully contribute to Portland's recovery while joining forces with an impressive and growing number of cities around the world to become part of the network of blue and green cities committed to global climate recovery. So um, we've been working for months um, with this small group um, and um, we've done a Thank, thank, thank you to Catalysis for sort of um, hurting us as cats. Um, and then of course we brought in um, Eco Northwest uh, to do um, some inventory work and to an assessment work and to come, uh, to come forward with some opportunities for us to get this work done. So I'm just gonna pass it back to Chris to tee us up for the next conversation. Yeah, so I'm going to bring up Becky in uh, just a moment, and but I do want to say, sorry, <laughs> I knew I was going to have this so excited. Um, I do want to say that Jamila and I were really impressed with the work that the group did. Um, starting out, everyone was brought together around a topic that's pretty confusing, has a sense of urgency, and we're able to step back and really do um, very open-minded thinking, having good conversations around what's the shared language. How do bureaus use terms, even like natural areas, differently? And so, you know, working with those considerations and really thinking about what's possible in terms of having um, the greater, more equitable outcomes and, and more impactful in terms of climate uh, resiliency. So uh, that was the, the, the workshop started with everyone kind of coming in, wondering what their role was. And at the end of the day, everyone said, yeah, we're in this together. We're not here as separate viewers. So with that, I'll turn it over to Becky. This is gonna be a lot more detailed. Um, please do take notes if you have specific questions. All right, thank you so much. Um, and thanks for inviting me to be here. I'm very excited to talk about the service delivery uh, uh, assessment inventory. And so um, my name is Becky Steffler and I'm a project director at Echo Northwest. And I was joined by my colleague, uh, Mary Chase, um, who helped to put this uh, um, inventory and assessment together. And uh, I think you've gotten some of the background on kind of why we were brought in uh, the five bureaus that we were working with, um, uh, Environmental Services, uh, Portland Parks and Recreation, uh, Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, uh, Bureau of Transportation, and then the Water Bureau. And um, basically uh, key staff at each of those bureaus went through a lot of their documentation to say, where are the places where we really either have friction or we really need to coordinate because for a wide variety of reasons. And so they put together an uh, inventory of about 141 documents uh, that Mary and I then went through to understand you know, what exactly kind of was happening there. And we had some guidance from uh, the resolution on topics. So when we actually started going through it, we came up with nine different uh, areas where there was some kind of natural um, uh, groupings of, you know, kind of what was in those particular documents. So we separated it out by access to nature, environmental education, stewardship, and community gardens, uh, climate resilience, environmental planning and policy, uh, fish and wildlife, green stormwater infrastructure, natural areas, remediation, urban tree canopy, and vegetation. This is in alphabetical order, not uh, of, <laughs> of importance or where most of the documents were. Um, so we did a rapid scan, kind of just looking and being able to quantify what's it, what do we have here and where what kind of coordination is necessary, um, looking at the types of documents and really looking at those kind of funding flows, um, and then identifying opportunities. And I just want to emphasize, these are not recommendations. It is but one step of a much more involved process, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, um, but there's definitely some opportunities that we did identify. Uh, and then um, we did just because this was about, or this really is about improving governmental services. And so there's a question, what did that really mean? And I think that's an important um, definition that the city is really going to have to grapple with to understand, you know, for the, the decisions they make down the road, um, you know, what are the most important 
elements of that to tackle. Um, and then we created a discussion draft for the uh, for the directors of the five bureaus and their key staff, and we gave a presentation with that discussion draft at the end of June. And then based on feedback um, from that presentation, and then the staff actually getting to read through the entire document, um, we revised that and uh, delivered a, a final um, a final deliverable, a final report. So I just want to emphasize, um, there's nothing like looking through a lot of documents to say, okay, this looks like a problem. Um, it reminded me of, uh, you know, imagine you've got a couple and they've been married for 50 years and they come to you and they say, we're on new parts in our lives. We want you to remodel our house. But the only information they give you is the, the floor plan uh, for the house that they've been living in. So, um, and again, I just want to emphasize, you know, that's, that's really what we had to look at. Um, but there's so much institutional knowledge that really builds up to, you know, what was all the background that got um, uh, the, the bureaus to actually uh, create those, those agreements and memorandum and, and all the things that kind of went into it. And that's really important information to think about, you know, what's going to work best going into the future. Uh, and so, um, and this inventory only represents those things where there's there's a real overlap between different bureaus. And so it is not a complete picture of everything that bureaus do. And so that's also something to take into consideration as well. And of course, a lot of these documents cover a lot of those nine topic areas. And so, but we, we, we place them in one and um, just done with the understanding that um, it covers uh, you know, many other topics. So there's just a few limitations. So looking at the numbers. Um, so just kind of looking at uh, those nine topic areas and the 141 documents. And then something else we wanted to do too is understand how many, um, what are the different bureaus that are actually coordinating in those different documents? So that is why if you look at the five columns on the right, they don't add up to the, col the column on the left um, because there's multiple bureaus that had some role or touch um, those different documents. But it starts to give you a sense of you know, where's the, the most coordination happening. And so um, from this, environmental planning and policy is definitely um, one of those places where we see a lot of that coordination and overlap. Um, but then also in natural areas and green stormwater infrastructure, um, I would say we're the, the top uh, three topics. And I'm going to be talking more about those. And, and if you're like me, a visual really helps to see just where is all that coordination happening. And most of it is happening between um, environmental services and parks and recreation. But of course, all these bureaus are, are having to coordinate uh, with each other. So this just kind of gives you a sense of, of where most of these relationships are happening in the documentation. Uh, and then just looking at the types of documents that were uh, in the inventory, and again, agreements. Um, so some kind of like, how are we going to operate? How are we going to work with each other? Who's going to be involved? What's the schedule? How are we going to report to each other? A lot of that detail was in a lot of these documents. Uh, and then also just kind of those, um, not just uh, between the bureaus, but sometimes with external organizations as well. So other governmental agencies or nonprofit organizations, um, there's a lot of that kind of coordination happening uh, as well as um, the design of programs. Uh, so we saw quite a few uh, documents like that. Uh, one of my favorites is looking at the funding flows. And again, this is not the entire budget for each of the bureaus, but really um, just what was in the documentation itself. So um, environmental services is definitely spending um, uh, funds towards green stormwater infrastructure and environmental planning, um, remediation and others, but they're definitely one of the, the funder um, bureaus and a little bit less so for the, for the other ones. So just to kind of give you a sense. And again, this is not the complete budget for any of these bureaus. Uh, and then just looking at the flow of funding between the different bureaus or other organizations, this also gives you a sense of um, um, environmental services is definitely working a lot. And some of those funding flows are going towards Portland Parks and Recreation, also to community partners, consultants and contractors, um, things of that nature. They get a little bit back too. So I wanna talk in a little bit more detail with four of these um, specific topic areas. And uh, uh, and these were the ones where I would say that there was the most overlap. And climate uh, resilience was probably one where there wasn't as much documentation, but I have definitely found in so many of the conversations that I have about 
a wide variety of policies. Usually the questions are, what are the equity implications and what does this mean for greenhouse gas reduction or climate resilience? Um, and definitely, I would say that that was um, a theme here as well in the, the documents um, themselves. And also just looking at uh, kind of the emerging um, importance and definitely the um, climate emergency plan that the city has recently uh, adopted, definitely a long-term uh, understanding of the risks related to climate change. That's nothing new. Uh, but the new opportunities um, with the Portland Clean Energy Funds and the roughly $750 million that the city plans um, to invest through that fund into climate that will touch all of the bureaus in one way or another. It felt like this was definitely one area that the city should be paying attention to. Um, and, and thinking about how that um, how you really provide the best uh, public service uh, related to climate resilience and how the different bureaus are gonna potentially work together on that. Uh, one of the next areas was definitely on the green stormwater infrastructure. And so the Bureau of Environmental Services uh, is the lead on many of these particular activities um, and they're paying attention to federal regulations, um, especially to uh, TMDLs, the um, uh, thinking about uh, uh, pollutants in our storm uh, water or waterways. And so, as well as thinking about the, um, and addressing regulations from the state level, as well as um, regional and, and local uh, as well. And so they're often working with the other bureaus and uh, definitely um, Parks and Recreation on their role in complying with these uh, federal, state or local uh, regulations. Um, but this also, uh, they're also coordinating a fair amount on capital improvements. So uh, the, the building of infrastructure uh, related to this and um, as well as on uh, uh, operations and maintenance. And they're also working with uh, outside organizations as well, just thinking about the grant programs uh, that are related to, um, to green stormwater. Uh, natural areas, this was definitely one topic that I would say had probably the most uh, uh, the highest number of documentations and the most kind of coordination and the amount of detail that went into this surprised even me uh, when it comes to, you know, how are we going to coordinate on um, places where we have facilities, where the bureaus have um, facilities that are either co-located or adjacent to each other. And there's the potential, um, just the, the need to, to really work together to make sure that, um, that they're operating those particular facilities um, to the best of their abilities and, and just working out all the, the different issues that potentially come up. And so um, quite a few memorandums of understanding that have been updated over time, the detail, who is working on what, how often they will meet, what are the reporting that they're going to be uh, uh, presenting and what's gonna be in those reports, like a lot of detail and coordination in natural areas. Uh, most of this is between um, uh, environmental services and parks, but definitely the Water Bureau also has a lot of co-located facilities. I'm thinking of reservoirs and other uh, water storage, uh, as well as um, there were a number of documents uh, that also detailed how um, the city's gonna be working with other jurisdictions like Metro um, or even other nonprofits or other organizations. Um, so there was a, a fairly high number in this particular area. A lot, a lot of things are going on and the city is definitely very busy. Uh, urban tree canopy uh, is another uh, area where there is a lot of coordination and it touches on uh, a lot of the work that the city does. And of course this is, uh, you know, there are millions of trees throughout the city of Portland. Most of those are on uh, private lands, but a lot of those are in parks. And then also along, uh, uh, city streets, and so within the right of way, um, and that's really important as we're thinking about making an environment that is comfortable to walk, bike, and take transit. So low carbon transportation options, um, and especially for uh, many uh, residents who are dependent, um, or maybe don't have a car, or have fewer cars, or uh, less access uh, to vehicles, and um, uh, especially as we get into these uh, hot days of summer, and I keep on looking at next week and how hot it's supposed to get. Um, and I definitely feel for folks that um, are going to be outside and the, the relief you get from uh, tree canopy. 
And definitely that's another area where the clean energy fund uh, is uh, definitely there's a, a portion of those funds that are geared towards uh, increasing urban canopy because I'm sure you can imagine it is not equitably distributed. And there's actually studies that show that you can, uh, um, there's a correlation between urban canopy and income for residents that live under it. So uh, a, a portion of the funds from the Clean Energy Fund are going to uh, increase tree canopy and plant trees along 82nd and other places in East Portland. Um, but there's a lot to, to coordinate there and definitely the Bureau of Environmental Services uh, is also uh, very involved. I feel like I kind of went off on a little tangent there. It's maybe my own personal um, passion. <clears throat> so, um, so urban tree canopy was definitely one of those areas where there's a lot of coordination uh, uh, needed. And then the other five, just kind of as a reminder, uh, definitely uh, coordination, but it just wasn't quite at the level of at least three of the topics I covered. And then climate just felt like it was um, also an up and coming uh, potential topic, but access to nature, uh, environmental planning, fish and wildlife, remediation, and then vegetation. And I can go back to it and provide some additional information if needed. So, oh, um, uh, so one of the things, like I said, uh, I know I was interested in, in just kind of thinking about how do you improve public service? And so just did a little bit of uh, research and put into here, you know, what are the things to potentially think about just in general? And uh, three of those came up, uh, thinking about where can the city look for greater efficiencies in service delivery? And so that could be anything from reducing costs, uh, reducing the amount of staff effort it takes to do the thing or actually doing it faster. Um, than uh, the city had in the past. Um, and I would say related to that is really kind of making sure that whatever you're doing more efficiently is also of high quality because um, it doesn't really do anyone much good if you can uh, provide low quality uh, services faster, cheaper, and <laughs> um, uh, with less effort. You really want to think about how can you improve the ecological services as well as those social benefits are related to it. Um, and really, again, kind of becoming more resilient to climate change, how can you achieve those co-benefits? And then also really thinking through those equitable uh, distribution of services. So how can we make sure that um, those equitable outcomes are, are part of this overall process in improving uh, Portland's public service? Uh, <laughs> This stuff is complicated, and that was definitely communicated in the documents that we reviewed. And there's a wide range of things that the city's going to really have to grapple with to make sure that they are um, addressed in whatever kinds of changes are made in the future. So uh, definitely that starts probably with all of the requirements uh, that are, have to be addressed through um, all the things that the, the five bureaus are doing related to uh, natural resources. So thinking about those federal, state, and regional regulations and guidance uh, related to that and often tied to it as well is thinking about that funding and financing. So do we have the resources in the right place to the right people to do the job that needs to be done? Uh, and that is often very complicated and it's often tied to specific types of activities um, or um, it can only be used to build some uh, capital, to build, to build things or sometimes it's only um, can be used for operations and maintenance. So that's complicated. Um, I think I've spoke ad nauseum about climate resilience, but there's definitely that opportunity to, and responsibility, I think, uh, for the city to continue to, to consider um, what are the changes gonna mean for becoming more climate resilient. Um, we had some long conversations about houselessness, and there were several documents uh, in the inventory that, um, that address some of those impact in natural areas. And uh, we definitely, part of that conversation was around the important role of, of many other bureaus, as well as uh, the county, um, the state, Multnomah County, and the state of Oregon in addressing that and really success in, in the natural area system and, and, um, and addressing some of those impacts is gonna require those other bureaus to be successful. And so, um, so there's, it, there was definitely the desire to, to be upfront about that and, um, and understanding that, that there are those impacts from people that are um, camping in our natural areas and the importance of the success of other efforts to really be able to come back and then be able to repair some of those, some of the, the damage um, that comes from that in a sensitive way. Uh, 
a lot, a lot of, uh, of the best practices kind of research also speaks to technology. Um, I wouldn't say any of the, the uh, documentation uh, really spoke to like, we really need to improve our technology, but maybe some of the testimony earlier today kind of uh, says that there's, there's room for improvement and making, you know, where can that technology really help us do our work? Or if you're combining uh, uh, activities with different bureaus, do they use different types of technology and what are going to be the needs to, um, to integrate or to, to train and, and move things around? So, so paying attention to the technology, I think, will be very important. And then finally, regardless of what you do, what you combine or potentially don't combine, there will always be the need to coordinate with other um, either bureaus at the city or other um, organizational units at the city, as well as outside partners. So that doesn't really go away. But maybe it gets easier. So I'm going to talk about the five uh, opportunities that we identified, and it kind of goes from the the least uh, the least amount of change to the the biggest change. Um, and really, I would say that this is probably some kind of a menu of options, uh, and there might be some kind of opportunity to pick and choose, which I anticipate that the city uh, uh, will likely do. And I'm using the term you probably heard me use it already, organizational unit. And it really, um, it kind of just acknowledges that through this full charter reform that um, maybe the city will continue to uh, uh, use bureaus or departments, whatever that term is, I'm choosing the, the neutral kind of organizational unit to, to talk about it. So the first one uh, is to, uh, to just keep the current organizational structure but there were still opportunities, even as we were reading through the documentation to improve um, equitable outcomes that are consistent with the city of Portland's core values. And so as we were going through these, um, we were really thinking, you know, who benefits from uh, the service and who pays for the service or doesn't receive it. And so even as we were reading through uh, related to floodplain management, urban tree canopy, access to nature, um, some of that remediation, and then houselessness in natural areas, uh, there's others as well. These were some that were just really kind of stuck out to us. Um, uh, and really, again, kind of thinking about who, who benefits from the, the public services that are available right now and how could those be potentially improved. And then even thinking about <clears throat> the opportunities um, that could improve equitable outcomes, uh, definitely making sure that um, that the different bureaus and how they are interacting both with organizations and individuals uh, have some opportunities there to and thinking about how they they do that kind of outreach and engagement uh, the potential to make sure that they're consistent in how they're compensating organizations to participate um, when that is needed uh, and even with the the messaging and communications uh, for uh, and working with uh, different organizations that's I think something that we heard from the the workshops. Uh, that was probably pretty consistent with the documentation that we looked at as well. And then just being kind of consistent on uh, those interactions um, with different organizations. Uh, the second opportunity uh, is to consolidate equitable delivery of the um, natural area services into one organizational unit. And so this is really to look at the planning, acquisition, development, operation and maintenance of designated natural areas including some of those built infrastructures such as trails and bridges, parking, trash receptacles and gates, and uh, green infrastructure such as vegetation. Um, looking at the ecological restoration, especially flood storage and floodplain reconnection, and then being consistent with outreach, education, stewardship, and partnerships kind of uh, related um, to these natural areas. So that was one opportunity. Uh, the third one was consolidating equitable delivery of green stormwater infrastructure services into one unit. Um, so again, kind of that planning and design, construction, operations, maintenance, and emergency response for uh, green stormwater facilities, including swales, green streets, green rain gardens, eco roofs. Um, and then again, consolidating all the outreach, education, and partnerships related to green stormwater infrastructure um, into, that, um, into that unit. Uh, finally, opportunity four uh, is the consolidate equitable delivery of the following uh, urban tree canopy services into one unit. 
uh, and all the tree planning, maintenance, emergency response, and contracted services, making sure that they comply with Title 11, and then again, all the um, you know, all the education and outreach uh, related to tree canopy into uh, into that unit. And then the grand finale, Opportunity Five, is to um, basically put it all together in one place. This is definitely um, probably the most radical kind of opportunity. Um, and given the scale, some phasing probably would be in order um, to do that. And then finally, um, as I said before, uh, there's a this is but one step in this bigger process. And there's a number of things that the city should do before they make decisions. And so um, there's quite a few other communities across the United States that have combined services in one way or the other, and some do it well and some do it poorly. And it would be good to, um, to understand what uh, sets a city up for success. And so there's quite some additional kind of best practices and discussions we had with, with peer cities. Uh, definitely an assessment of the responsibilities and roles, uh, systems and processes, like just how would it work? Um, what's really being done and, and what does it look like in actuality, putting those work plans together. Uh, and again, I think there's additional work that needs to be done related to equitable natural resource service delivery. So really thinking about how do we ensure that uh, uh, that the city is improving equitable outcomes and not uh, uh, to continuing um, uh, historic inequities in whatever is done. Uh, this is going to affect a lot of people, so there's additional um, public engagement and, and uh, stakeholder work that needs to be done, and I think this is just part of it. Uh, so talking to folks and giving them an opportunity to weigh in is going to be important as well. Uh, like I said, regardless, uh, there's going to be additional work that needs to be done coordinating with other city bureaus or other organizational units, uh, working with external partners on any of these um, particular areas that are going to concern them. Uh, making sure that the resources are there to pay for the work that needs to be done, and then making sure that the technology uh, works. And so with that, uh, that's just the summary. And um, I think at this point, I we would be open for questions. Thank you so much. Can I check in with you if I'm comfortable with how much time we have for Q&A? It looks like we have 45 minutes. Oh, Unless we have somebody comes uh, for public comment. So like at a quarter of seven or so, we'll ask everyone to pause and we'll see if anyone's joined us for public comment. But Well, then for the questions, um, I can uh, uh, field questions in the room, but why don't we start with the folks online since uh, it's often harder. Jamil is going to take care of the folks online. So uh, yeah, we'll have Ali Berman. Yeah, can you clarify what you mean by a unit? Uh, <laughs> and I might want to uh, some of the, uh, the uh, key staff at the city as well. It could be a bureau or a department. Um, it's just acknowledging that the the um, terminology for bureau might not it might change. Yeah, and Please I'll, help me. I'll add that um, it's. Purposely nebulous, right? Because we wanted to, I we wanted to acknowledge that if we were thinking about streamlining, aligning, or consolidating any of these services, that it may not live in a organizational unit that already exists. Whether that's a bureau, a division, a work unit, whatever it is, and it allows for that flexibility, especially when you look at the five different opportunities like if this ends up being sort of an a la carte menu situation it may not be that we're having a conversation about a full bureau so um it's just meant to be undefined okay it it definitely feels undefined um okay yeah uh, i will say um i find the idea of uh number five really exciting it's felt like for a long time um, natural resources and environmental services have been really separated out throughout the city. And then you have kind of, you know, bigger documents and like the comprehensive plan, which sort of outline things, but how people coordinate and how it works has always felt really challenging. Um, so I would say whether you went with number five or you went with something else, 
uh, a body that helps keep track and organize and keep tabs on what the city's obligations are and how those are uh, following through. I think its own organizational unit is probably the easiest way to do that um, or the most centralized because uh, right now it's been so decentralized as you could see through all of those different people doing uh, lots of different work. So uh, just a comment on number five sounding uh, exciting and again has a lot of implications not sure what that means but um, to have it be centralized does uh, would bring a lot of benefits. Thank you, Ali. We'll, we'll turn to folks in the room. And I didn't see whose cards came up first, but I'm going to start with Jonathan. Oh, thanks. Um, thank thanks. you, Max, all very much. Great. Um, obviously, you have the opportunities identified. There's a moving forward, next steps identified as well. And so, in the background, that this was to be, it's just still like, it puts a timeline in. Is it still fall 2023 termination here or deciding so, what broke? We don't anticipate that there will be a determination fall of 2023. Um, we've, we're collecting input from various surveys, and one, one of which will be um, submitted to all of you today. Um, there is a possibility that we might, based on those surveys, be able to call this list a little bit. Uh, but the idea is that we would present these opportunities as recommendations with the understanding that there's a lot of additional work that would need to be done for a neck for a decision. Um, so that would be submitted to the chief administrative officer, who in turn is presenting an organizational chart and future improvement recommendations to the council in October. Thank you. Um, we'll go to Chris. Uh, Chris. Uh, this is incredibly robust and helpful information. Um, I think I have some questions about if there has been further analysis done of which of the five bureaus and the funding stream have, and for lack of better terms, like the most frontline staff who are engaging in the customer service delivery or even natural resources um, interacting in, in those spaces for the natural resource delivery. And I ask that because um, it's interesting to see where the funding flows from those five bureaus to all of the different topic areas. And when you're thinking about maybe moving just even to one organizational unit, what does that mean for the different staffing populations in those bureaus and the lack of um, funding flexibility? And then if you are going to disentangle that funding, like how embedded is that funding with other programs and FTEs within the staffing structure. I, and I say this because I come from a state agency who just came from a state agency and pulled a massive program over from another state agency. And I, I think if things were starting from the beginning, um, it's much easier to build out that infrastructure, but disentangling, for lack of a better term, requires a lot of funding and a lot of staffing structure that the city may or may not have in, while they're moving to a new structure with a charter. Um, and it's a lot of change at one time. So I'm just thinking about that kind of analysis and the different funding mechanisms and what the flexibility is for who gets that funding. And if it was one organizational unit, would that lend itself to better flexibility in that funding? And then my other thought is, I'm sorry that I feel like I'm just talking free flow here, um, is if there isn't a move to one organizational unit in the interim, is there an idea or ideas of what a priority um, ranking process for those topic areas or even projects would be between the five bureaus um, and moving them forward? Thank you. That's, a, that's a big <laughs> question. I only put this up because I'm going to start and answer, and then I'm going to remind folks that my uh, colleague extraordinaire, Don Uchiyama, is the Director of Bureau of Environmental Services, uh, is also on the line. And our amazing project manager, Shayna Anderson, has been one uh, with us as well. So 
they probably know even more. Um, so I'm going to lean on uh, on the, those lovely folks um, to answer as well. So a couple of things. Disentangling is a perfect um, verb to describe what we're going to happen. And I think the, the slide that Becky showed that showed um, all of the things to consider is the reason why we're probably only going to have option like these opportunities presented in October because it is really complex <laughs> and convoluted. Um, and and I think the further you go down that option list, the more complex and convoluted it gets, right? Um, and it also lends to the whole idea of, of a phased approach, regardless of whatever gets decided. So yes and yes, it's a mess and or potential mess, and we haven't gotten that far, but we've identified it as something that is necessary for us to move. And then the other piece around, question around FTE, I don't know the numbers. Do you know the numbers in terms of like FTE by Bureau that's doing this work? No, so I, I believe we do have that, but not just me, but we can certainly do that too. Um, and if we talk long enough, maybe somebody will look it up. Um, hint, hint. Um, and, but, but what I was going to say about the, about the funding for the FTE, um, some things are not... Um, are non-negotiable, right? So some of our bureaus are rate, are funded by ratepayers, and there there's you know they their services must get paid by that. We have levy funding. We've identified what is and isn't eligible to be for levy funding. So so there's definitely you know there's some nuances there that we definitely need to be thought through. Um, but I think it can be disentangled. We code our budgets like line items for things all the time, it's just, it would be very complex. And I think I, I tried to answer, but I'll see if any of my colleagues have anything to say. Um, let's turn to Don. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you uh, for uh, having us this evening and uh, thanks to everyone who's presented and all the good questions. I, I really don't have much more to add other than I do think I, I really want to underline and appreciate the idea of untangling uh, this, this situation. And of course, our form of government has uh, kind of put us in, into this uh, situation. And so we, we do have to untangle. But I'm also... Um, I, I I want to also emphasize the idea that we we do have regulations and we do have requirements that will uh, not only help um, formulate how we organize the resources, but then also formulate how we pay for the services that we provide. So while we don't have all of that mapped out today and, and uh, won't get into that detail today, I just want to offer assurances that uh, uh, especially for from my perspective from BES, we're a highly regulated utility, and we have very specific um, requirements around our funding, our our utility rates, and so all of that will need to be taken into consideration uh, as we bring these uh, pieces together. It it isn't easy, but it also isn't impossible, and uh, I think that we can definitely clean things up and make it much more transparent than uh, what we're doing right now. So I uh, really appreciate the good questions and uh, we'll look forward to more feedback and, and discussion uh, as we continue to sort out the path forward. Can I go and answer your last? So two questions that I think are interrelated, but maybe not. Um, the first is early on um, in the presentation, you all talked about areas of potential coordination and areas of overlap and areas of friction. And I am wondering if we heard a lot about areas of overlap. I am wondering if the areas of friction that you identified parallel those areas of overlap where there's more going on together, there's more friction or if the friction was actually more consolidated in some of the smaller areas where there's maybe not as much overlap and what that looked like. And then you want me to stop there and I'll ask the second part after. Yeah. Okay, sure. I would say it was really hard to tell, but the amount of detail that was in some of the documentation uh, led me to believe by inference that that detail was necessary just to like to, to communicate the complexity. Um, and like, I have no idea of what the history was leading up to it either. Like I literally was just looking at um, what was written on the page. So uh, uh, if I, 
And I don't know if the, the I, I would say anything else. Yeah, I would say the and also the more recent agreements were probably more complex because you learn what went wrong, <laughs> right? So so there's there was probably even more language to to ensure uh, that there would be less conflict and issues. So yeah. So friction distributed it sounds well, like in the areas of more overlapping in some of the areas. Friction. Risk aversion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and maybe that means that the second part of my question is um is normal, but I was wondering if the opportunities for change that you identified reflected where you thought there was the most overlap. So it was easiest to create um consolidation, or if it reflected where there was the most opportunity for gain with consolidation, especially around equity and some of the other values pieces, or if it reflected where there was the most friction that needed to be addressed, um, or if it was some combination of those things. I would say the opportunities really leaned into the most complexity um, and and just the, the volume of uh, the need to coordinate among the different bureaus. Uh, and I, I remember having a kind of qualitative conversation. You know, if if the if these two things had to happen, or this this thing had to happen, and it was within one bureau, would this be a lot easier? And I think the response was like, "Oh yeah, like so not necessarily most change in outcome that Portlanders would see, not necessarily most gain in equity, but most streamlining of bureaucracy." Essentially, I think it's. I think there's probably a combination, though, of those things. Um, and probably was what was most evident to our work was the streamlining of bureaucracy. Um, but I, I, without a doubt, anticipate that there's elements of all of those things uh, in fair, you know, in a variety of levels um, throughout the the topic areas that we were looking at. I wouldn't rule it out. Um, I've got three questions. Um, can you move on from me at any time? Um, I think the process question, so I think it's pretty quick. Uh, the first question is actually, Director Long, you were referring earlier on to small group discussions. And I just want to make sure that I've just wondered if that small group discussions within each department or was it included, include a representative from all departments? I'm trying to make sure all five were involved. Oh, okay. yeah, just, yeah, all five all were, five. all five. Your director, right. as well as um, uh, identified subject matter experts for uh, for natural resource service delivery, and we we were herded like cats by Shayna and Laura. Absolutely. Perfect on all counts, including three. <laughs> um, Becky, I was wondering, um, you were talking about you you said that your review was based on document review only. But now I assume a draft is now circulating all around. Will you incorporate comments that you're getting verbally into your um, report? Uh, we we definitely incorporated the um, the feedback we got from the directors during the from the dis the discussion draft, uh, as well as additional written comments. And I, I will say we worked uh, very closely with Laura and, and Shana. And I asked them a whole bunch of questions, and it was great. It was the two of them because so many of the documents really were related to how is environmental services and parks and recreation. Uh, you know, what do these documents mean? Um, so they definitely had the largest volume. So, uh, so that was that was pretty good. I we're not planning on revising the document anymore, but I don't. I think the feedback into the process um, allows for that kind of like you know, what does this really mean, and what do we do with it. And you can cry yeah, please. Yeah, I think the surveys will help us, um, will help inform um, just the feedback in general, it will help inform. And I don't know if we we'll actually change that document because that isn't deliverable from the Northwest. However, we <laughs> um, will be creating an action plan, right. potentially even a resolution at some point. I don't know, but yeah. Sure. So, it's a block. Yeah, it? there's. Exactly. And then the last question is regarding the, the opportunities that you list. At any point, did you talk to the, the um, chief administrative officer's office about what they were thinking about what the overall structure of the city is going to be as you were developing your office? So, um, 
There's about 25 of us bureau directors who meet weekly with the chief administrative officer, and we're all very much involved in um, programmatic assessment around the organization of future improvements. He's been brought along and will likely, I, I believe he'll be attending the August 30th. We're going to do another presentation for senior level staff. And then I will also add that the chief administrative officer is the former bureau director of environmental services. So he is well aware of this conversation. In fact, when he and I, when I started, we were both under the purview of Nick Fish and that's when this, these conversations started, you'll notice in 2019, um, to blame for that, the 2019 MOUs and MOAs. So we've started this conversation in 2019. This is sort of like, oh, this is a great opportunity for us to really sort of get started. So he's very much aware. Right, um, we're gonna, Ali, I'm gonna pause on you um, and go around and get other people first. Thank you. I'm glad that we're here. I know it's kind of uh, um, been a process and probably been needed for a really long time. I don't know that I have so much a question. I just am thinking, I know this is a long process and I just want to acknowledge the uh, form of government we have kind of getting us to this point in some way. I guess my only concern about, and I know this is far, far off, but just given how every bureau is so responsible for so much, for doing so much and not, you know, there's not that kind of centralized support in the city of Portland, um, the cost of creating a new bureau and needing its own accounting, needing its own like communications, all of that kind of overhead type administrative type costs. Um, Again, far, far out, but just hearing that, I think like there's so much need and I can hear Ali's original comment in my head, but then I also think, like it needs to be centralized, but you know, how can you do that without adding on all that? All that I'm an accountant, so I guess I can say it all, all that admin. So, yeah, I live in Portland. I'm really excited to see what uh, we can do with my city. And, and I'll say we're having that exact conversation like times 20. Yeah, because, well, yeah. because we're all working as service areas, we're all working on programmatic assessments and giving recommendations of, around our service area and the rest of the city. And every single one of them has that sort of consideration. And, and there's co conversations about, you know, centralizing versus standardizing mm -hmm. right. procurement, human resources. So we have the, a lot of citywide, right, infrastructure admin functions that are not only happening at this, being like this, bureau level, but they're also happening in the bureaus. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of conversations mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. Not just here. Like not just this one little mm -hmm. nugget. Yeah. Adam. Thank you. Um, so I believe that this was mentioned in uh, opportunities for further research. So I apologize if this work hasn't been done yet. Um, but I was reading through these opportunities and I'm curious if during any of the stages of this process, whether it's the document review, or the, the small group discussions with bureau directors, if there was ever an element of comparative analysis, that if other cities have tried versions of these opportunities, and if so, did they have similar climates to Portland? Or similar sizes, anything like that? Yeah, I think that was on the list of like future work. Sure. Yeah, yeah. so Let's that was a comparative analysis, but mm -hmm. I don't think it was part of the, our general conversation. It, it sure. certainly came up as an important thing to look yep. at, and then there are other examples that, that need to be considered mm -hmm. how how successful they were. Um, yeah, of course. I, I'm going to shoot it to Allie, and then I'll come. Okay, okay. Allie. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. I saw, you know, there's so much analysis of documents and things that are already taking place. Did you find uh, areas where um, no one fully owned something or there was a, a lack of attention to something that was a priority in the city or like, to me, I look at like lighting and lighting design and light pollution as an example of an area that, you know, does anyone actually own it? So there were there areas where things fell between the cracks that a more centralized um, approach or assigning it to someone could be really beneficial? You know, I'll say I was really like our scope of work was really focusing on what was in the inventory. And so it was not 
we didn't look at all of the potential, either what the bureaus did or what they could potentially do. So it, we just didn't um, like, there, there wasn't that kind of an assessment that was done. I would say to move this forward, asking those questions, not just to the um, bureaus doing the work, but to community partners and uh, looking again at the comprehensive plan and other documents of what um, should be happening. Uh, just again, it's you're looking at what's already there, but are there things that are missing that should also be put into this conversation? I think the slide that showed sort of the the top four themes and then the the sort of the five that fell below the line, not that it truly speaks to that that suggestion, Ali, but I think that those five that fell below the line are all very important services that we provide, and maybe there there's a there there. Um, but it's a, a point well taken. Thank you, Ali. That's a good question. And before I talk, I believe somebody online, I think it was Shauna Anderson, if I had to part of the program. Oh, sorry, I thought it's all a question. Shana is on Zoom. Yeah, Shana, did you have something? You can put your hand down. But thank you. I, I did. I think it was sufficiently answered, but there was a question of kind of the origin of these opportunities and how long we've looked into them or have recognized them. And I wanted to point out that under Commissioner Fish, Parks and BES were, of course, under the same person and were kind of tasked to look in where there are overlaps and where we could do a better job at what we're both doing. Um, so that was just going to be part of my response to the question about how we arrived at these five. Um, came about. Suen, and I'll, 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 I'll go after you. I just want to make sure that everybody has it. Okay. Um, I just want to applaud the daunting effort wanting to start something like that. Um, very important work. Um, the, Biggest question I have here is how how do how do you as collective team, consultant and staff leaders, how do you ensure to see this through so that this doesn't just end up with just documents or recommendations? Or if there's any change of leadership structure, uh, all of a sudden there's no follow through. And how do you measure success in, in this moving forward? Because it's so important, yet it's so daunting. Yeah, um, I would say that the whole impetus to doing this work was the charter reform and the change in the organization government structure, right? It, the reason why we have 141 documents that tie our work together is because we've operated in, in different silos, um, doing work that that overlaps and complements one another. And um, we just put in perspective, I've been here four and a half years and I've had five bosses. So can you, you can imagine that some of these bureaus so we're talking about five bureaus that have had a multitude of directors. We've had a multitude of leaders at, at the elected le level, right? It's, it's many, many years of tangling, right? So now th this charter reform and this reorg, and this you know restructuring of, of the organization structure, that's the impetus for getting this work done. And the idea is that we're all gonna report up to a city administrator, to a mayor, um, and so there's going to be accountability and a, a buck that stops. <laughs> and I think that many of us um, are doing all this work that I talked about, like meeting weekly and having these conversations and doing these assessments because we want to hand off a, a, a city that's a little bit better off to a new city administrator um, so that they have some, that one that we can hire one that wants to hire a part. So I just want to come here. Um, but also to start that work, right? This is work that has been really challenging to do with our form of government. And so we're, we're fixing a, a many, many years of, um, I like to say, spit and glue and smoke and mirrors. 
So I have a barrage of questions, and yeah, that's why you're waiting to the end, right? But that's why you're waiting to the end, right? Because otherwise, it'll take up too much space. Um, so I, I, I am with and in alignment with Ali regarding Opportunity 5 uh, as being the most appealing to me because I think it's really about, for me anyway, it's about really getting towards an integrated ecology within our city. And what I'm really hoping that somehow maybe a master plan, another word for master, but a plan comes together in some way um, in thinking through this. Um, one thing that I would like to see moving forward this is a personal rub for me, and you can probably see me in other meetings around urban tree canopy. Can we talk about green, green and gray canopy infrastructure? Because I think it's really important for um, resilience. And if we're talking about frontline communities, we cannot wait 15, 25 years for those trees to maturate to do their job. So what are the sort of more inventive ways, whether that is creating uh, uh, pollinator or what they call nature patches, but on top of bus stops, you know, what does it mean to think through novel ecosystem, um, novel ecosystems in general, mm -hmm. and thinking through this in phases in which the community members that are on the front line that need this the most are not waiting for perfect mm -hmm. and getting away of their survival. And so when we're having these conversations, and I understand there's a lot of, oh, how is this going to happen and everything like that, but um, I would love to see what the vision of this actually means for community members. What would this look like? What would it feel like? What is the, what is the appeal of all this work and this restructuring that everything's going on to what vision, what goal, where's our North Star in this? Um, if you can give me anything, and I understand you did a content analysis <laughs> of documents and, and, and that in and of itself, like pulling out a meaning and mm -hmm. connotation and looking for alignment. Um, are you seeing a, a shared vision of what a fully integrated blue green city could mean for Portland? And then back casting <laughs> to what type of government do we need? What type of system needs to be in place to manage this, to think through this, to fund it. Yeah, I, I think I really would turn to the directors for that vision looking forward because my job is really to look in the past and be like, you know, where where is that, that complexity? But um, I know that we really tried to think through, again, just even as we were going through those, you know, what are the implications for those frontline communities and whatever you do, even if you don't do anything else at all, looking at how you can uh, achieve those more equitable outcomes with, you know, with whatever, with, with whatever choice and whatever path is, is chosen. But yeah, I'm I definitely- love, I'd love to be a Sanctopa moment. Let's go back to see if we forgot so we can yeah. like, create a different future. Um, I, I guess uh, what I have to add is there are many brilliant, passionate people working in many of our bureaus who are having conversations around that exact thing for a long time. And um, I think that there's probably many individual and, and smaller visions of what that looks like. Um, I think this is an opportunity for us to imagine what that looks like as a greater collective um, and create a system to actually think about it and see it forward. So I, mean, I just know we have even some staff led conversations around climate action that are not, that are, that are like staff but not city, <laughs> city generated. So there, there's definitely a lot of passion and, and, um, and brilliant minds that are thinking about this. So I don't think we're quite there yet, but I think creating a structure in which we can actually have that conversation um, in a meaningful way that is sustainable um, and uh, that, that's inclusive. Like we've been doing what we can with what we have for living with like that. Yeah, that I think that's what scares me the most is that we're going to adhere to some traditions that no longer benefit yeah. us um, and keep us back from the inventions and the integrated technology that we actually need. Because um, I, I think it's very clear to all of us sitting in this room, hopefully, and those that are online, that climate change is not a future 
It's 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 it's, it's a couple of years ago, right? right? We're in it. We're we're, yeah. we're in it, and, and so I think having that that vision and what that looks like and how it functions is going to be super important for community members to say, yeah, I think I need my tax money to go to that because you doing a really good blood thing well, <laughs> means I can understand where I'm, I'm living and what that means. They said that when they when they said you could do so, mm -hmm. frankly. The that that sort of approach was the, the really how we moved back in the workshops instead of going right to how okay how do our bureaus fit together we have the group you know pause and take that step back into the conditioning that Jimmy was talking about um, and. That's just a start. But one thing that happened in that room was that everyone came thinking, I have to sort of represent my bureau and figure out what's this problem, what's this thing we've been handing, shifting into having a different conversation, which was how do we do things differently? Uh, the, the thing, though, to, to speak back um, to your question, though, how do you stick through it? How do you follow that? That's a real big concern and a real uh, something that's going to take you in this different level. But I do have to acknowledge Director Long and Director Luciana's uh, knowing that they're bringing forward a plan for how this has to continue to be developed, not okay, we think we should pick number two and number four. And I think that's. Um, part of putting that work in front of the city to say, this has to go forward in a different kind of way and in different questions to be asked. And they're not answered by a human process. Yeah, I think, good. so two things, I'm going to put a pin in this. Um, I would love to see what that means, what are the next steps, what does it mean for communities to connect to this? And that vision is super, super important because, um, I don't know if people are even thinking about, I'm not sure that I pronounce this person's name right, the Milwaukee method of novel force creation, mm -hmm. not to be confused with uh, how famous anime, you know, Zaki no Force for it away. And Ponyo, but <laughs> also <laughs> important, very important. <laughs> but the Milwaukee method around novel force creation allows for the sort of the burst of vegetation in smaller spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would love to see some of that conversation about what's possible so we can figure out how to manage that possible future with those new forms of, of green space or ecology and what that means for community. Um, so I will shut up right there um, and, and go to um, both the, the interwebs and in the room, there's anybody that here for public comments. All right. Oh, we have one. Bruce is from Urban. Oh, wonderful. Bruce, go ahead. You have you have two minutes. No, he's with Urban Park. He's, he's invited. It, it's it's more of just uh, some comments. My name's Bruce Nelson. I'm a member of the Urban Forestry Commission, um, and I uh, am not. I haven't read this the original city resolution. Uh, which drove all of this forward. Um, in the early presentation this evening, with the use of the word natural resources, I was a little baffled. I wasn't sure whether it included natural resources on private property, private residential property, commercial property. Uh, and I, I think moving forward, that needs to be made clear. Clearly, there are regulations, code language that affects uh, natural resources on private property that all of the relevant bureaus are involved with. And um, if we're looking forward to what the climate is gonna be in our city, we have to consider the natural resources on private property, it's just a comment. Um, the second comment is on the opportunity summary the use of uh, the word green stormwater infrastructure. In the slide that was, I think, Kathy presented, 
I believe trees were not listed on that. And I believe if you look at the green water, stormwater uh, benefits that are derived from trees on public trees, private trees, right of way trees, it is enormous. And so if you are consolidating, if you did just number three, does that include trees or not? I think that's an area that would need to be clarified if that was addressed. Um, and so I think actually because of the fact that trees are under three and four and others, maybe that's why you would drive towards opportunity uh, the number five. But I know it's very hard to get there. There are a lot of steps and I appreciate the challenges, but um, the big thing is if we're talking about natural resources, I know the bureaus primarily are dealing with public assets, but um, there is so much on private property and what our regulations say about what can be done with those natural resources on private property is gonna play a tremendous role in what our city is like in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so one thing about the next steps. Um, to, to wrap up, we have two oh. more questions. So we have oh, two more questions. So I didn't, I thought we were going to be on that. This is actually um, addressing Director Long's comment about there are staff members who uh, already have a peace level of conversation. Um, I hope they are also intercultural conversation staff level. Um, it, it almost seems like it needs to be an uh, approach on the leadership as well as for the staff members that, that has opportunity to empower them to have them also be able to say, Every day, is there something I can do for my, my colleague or my counterpart? We can get together and then come up with something that actually is better the way we do things. That's, that's every day. You don't want to hear someone say, well, that about my pay grade. Well, at your pay grade, what can you do to make a difference? And, and I think they one can actually make change on the ground level that will say, this piece of paper is useless. Let's do it this way because you and I can actually get this done. It's like that drone, that whole issue. If it's not in our bureau, who's, who can do it? And can, can the inter-bureau staff level can just say, pick up a phone and then we can actually get something done. And maybe it kind of approaches as the next step to say, Maybe there are low hanging fruits that we can actually celebrate next week. And then there are big recommendations that will come in a year. And, and we can actually meet at every level that every day is something already better than what we did yesterday. Um, Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> are, we, are, we, are we starting a slow clap? <laughs> Thank you, Suen, Alana. And then we're going to finish it up with Matt because we are at 6.53. I was going to stick with thinking just about the information we were given and the bureaus that were a part of this, but Director Long, you said PSAP. And I have been wondering through this presentation, there are five bureaus who hold most of this work that they're talking to each other, but through this process, were any of the programs that are not a part of those bureaus or staff from bureaus who work closely with programs like PFAP that could have a big impact here, especially if we're talking about natural resources organizational unit that that program would likely be a part of. Have some of those smaller programs been integrated into these conversations in any way? So PSAP is housed in the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. So there's one of the five arrows and has been part of this conversation. Um, and there have been many conversations, um, and I would say especially recently, um, uh, the Urban Tree um, Canopy yeah. Initiative um, is 
has been developed because of our interaction with PISA. So like there's there's some synergy and, and momentum happening there. And I'll also add that um, as part of this overall um, charter reform and, and city organization work, um, uh, PSEP is very much on the minds of folks. And, and, and really, I mean, as, if you're following the news, you know, they keep on having to reinvent themselves and sort of stretch the parameters of their criteria because they're making so much money, right? Um, and so we, you know, as partners, we continue to have that conversation and they are at the table uh, as a part of this conversation. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's close this out. And this is really big and exciting stuff, and it's also really challenging um, to take on in the context of everything else that's going on. So, I just want to thank you, you, and everyone else. You all have a lot of awesome input. Thank you. Really thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I just wanted to say that I, we are, I kind of answered one of the questions, are we capturing what's happening in these meetings? Well, we're, I, our team is just capturing the questions uh, that are asked um, you know, in some of these conversations, but we are also going to distribute a survey, and this will be an opportunity to provide additional feedback on the opportunities and uh, plenty of open and ended space to add questions, comments, concerns, all of those things. I believe the link will be sent by Director Long, but you'll see in there that if you have any questions or concerns, you can contact Kyle Yoshioka on my team, uh, and they'll be able to get back to you and address any access concerns or concerns you have about the survey. We know we may not ask the, all the right questions, right? So if we haven't asked the right question, we still want to hear your thoughts on that. So feel free to add anything we didn't ask in the beginning. This is not a question for project staff. Uh, you all answered our questions uh, very well. Thank you so much for the information and the analysis of the inventory that's in directed along for what all of the five heroes are doing. I think in addition to the, my question is in addition to the survey as the Portland Parks Recommendation Board, what else can we do and participate and act as an advocate as this work moves forward, knowing that city leadership um, will be shaping the vision. So how can we also be a part in activity and shaping the vision and the interests of the Bureau as we move forward for this work? Um, I don't know the answer to that yet um, because we're doing so much so fast. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that we have a pretty good idea of what we are going to put forward to the chief administrative officer who will then create a, a general recommendation. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people putting input into this. Um, so I think once we know what's going to be going to council, we might be able to sort of circle back and, and have a conversation about that. Um, I don't want to preempt anything that, like, that doesn't become public knowledge. Um, I think there is an opportunity. I just really, it's not clear in my mind what that is yet. Um, and so, you know, we kept our stakeholder engagement pretty tight. It was the, uh, the public uh, Portland Utility Board um, and the Urban Forestry Commission and the Parks Board. So that was like sort of our, because there's not much to opine on, right? It's like the five options are, not that they're, there's not rocket science, let's put it that way, right? Um, but we really want to hear what the thoughts are. And we recognize that it's going to be a really heavy event. Um, I don't know, Don, do you have anything to add to that? No, the, other than we'll we'll know more soon. I mean, the work is is rapidly evolving, and uh, I think that we'll be eager to get your feedback through our survey work and to bring those uh, your comments and and thoughts and ideas forward into that discussion. But um, uh, other than just really emphasizing that this these um, decisions and some of these early steps are going to be happening uh, clearly this fall. Just echoing what Chris said, thank you so much for your presentation. Really appreciate the report, being able to read through it and come prepared with questions. And as always, thank you, Director Wong and staff, for allowing us to be in community. And as we can see, 
you know, being in community out loud or can you know, just person. come on in and let us know what's going on. So we're in a good place. And with that said, unless there's any other questions or comments, um, I would like to adjourn the meeting at 6.59 p.m. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you.